Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karthik Maheshwari. I'm a senior member of the Telecom Media and Technology team at Nishadesa Associates. And on behalf of everyone at Nishadesa Associates, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you. Uh, firstly, we apologize for the slight delay. There's been some traffic incident on 405 because of which you know we were waiting for uh, the conference is now being recorded. some of the participants to arrive. But uh, now that we're here, we'll, you know, we're very pleased to have you join us for the second edition of our annual media and entertainment conference. Uh, b before we dive right in, we'd just like to thank you know, all our partners, which is Fiki, Shekhar, uh, Tulsi, AIF, NASCOM, and TAI for you know, joining us for the, second for the second edition of this conference. Now I'd like to invite Nishit to, to commence the conference. Good morning. Yeah, a wonderful, I think. Uh, one interesting thing I heard uh, this morning uh, from uh, my American friend here, and while talking, uh, he agreed that uh, LA is also delay. You know, we understand usually that not the case in the West, but I think uh, there is strong Indian influence here in some ways. And, uh, you know, so I think. Uh, uh, it, I, Deepak will, of course, tell you, always relax, feel relaxed, you know. And I also believe that sleep, shower, and food never miss out. You know, flight may go, something else may happen, don't worry about it. So I think uh, it's a relaxed setting that we are going to be sitting in today, and uh, we are waiting for some of our friends to join us. But uh, welcome to this second edition of uh, uh, this, uh, what we call Unconference, uh, Future of Media and Entertainment in the Midst of Unpredictability. So. Uh, traffic jam, accidents, some of these things are unpredictable. They would hopefully become predictable at some point in time, but at this point in time, it's not uh, that predictable. It's wonderful that um, all of us at least are here. Um, <clears throat> as you all know that um, we have chosen a kind of unconference format, and that means there is more informality than formality in the conference, um, uh, coming together, discussing, ideating. I think today, the difference between our speakers and the, the audience has shrunk so much that often we do not know who knows more. At least I always feel that you all know more than what I know. And um, um, that's the format. So it's a, it's a free willing idea is to take our thinking, understanding to the next level, and the whole idea of this con unconference uh, last year when we started was uh, to take ourselves from uh, where we are to the next level, you know. And um, uh, there's so much happening around the world to take stock of uh, what's happening today, what is likely to happen tomorrow, and the day after, and so and so forth. So if we can gaze into the future, I think first of all that itself is an exciting thing, you know. Number two, if you can build something upon whatever you understand of the future, even though it's unpredictable, you know, uh, we can gain something. We can be prepared. Uh, I was, uh, you know, with Rudy Giuliani at one point of time, and uh, he told me how did he handle a September 11th episode, and and he said one thing that they had planned for everything that is likely to happen in the future. Somebody will put poison in the water and some blast will happen at railway station or airport or stuff. Nobody understood, nobody thought that there will be ever some people going and flying uh, directly into World Trade Center, you know, and the second one then happens, people are shocked. But the way in which uh, that, uh, uh, that whole problem was uh, at least addressed was there because they were prepared to do other things, you know, they could tweak around some of those principles and apply it to the new situation which were completely unexpected. So they were ready. Uh, one of the interesting things is said when something happens, you go as close to the site of disaster, but not so close as to burn yourself. Okay, it's very important for the top person in the organization to be as close as to those things. Uh, and uh, all, all the police and everything that happened around, or fire brigades or whatever. But they were prepared, so they could 
stick around. Situations will never happen exactly as to, you know, what you thought of. They will come in different form, different shape, different kind of, uh, you know, uh, ways. And uh, all that you do is to be prepared so that, you know, you can meet with those challenges. Otherwise, you can get uh, marginalized. You can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, wiped off uh, otherwise. And um, who knew that Amazon will come and Barnes and Nobles will go into problem? Who knew, uh, you know, uh, all the things that are seeing in the marketplace today uh, just was really not uh, uh, expected 20, 25 years ago. But uh, 10 years ago, there was a bubble uh, in the Silicon Valley. And that bubble was because people imagine what is going to happen. Some of them died in the process, but at the same time, many of them survived, and those who survived did an excellent job. Those who understood uh, what is going to happen in the future, they shaped, they rechanged, they reinvented themselves, and so on and so forth. I do not want to go too long uh, into the whole, um, you know, uh, subject right now, but uh, we have a very eminent uh, a friend, first of all, and a guest, uh, Deepak, and uh, Shekhar, of course. Uh, it, it's very nice to start with them. They are so inspiring. In fact, every time, every time I sit with them, I go away with something new, some new idea and some new way of thinking, and I learn a lot, you know. And uh, may I request, uh, Shekhar, why don't you start? And I think, let's take off uh, to this uh, on conference. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nishat. And uh, <clears throat> there I stand here when Deepak is sitting there. Yeah, come on. So, uh, <laughs> and we're running late anyway, and I'm going to invite Deepak to come and talk. And then later on, after Deepak has, has inspired you all, then Deepak and I will get into a conversation together. So welcome, everybody. Sorry we are late. Thank you, Nishat, and welcome, Deepak. Thank you very much. I, I asked Deepak, what, what will you talk about? And he says, whatever comes. So here comes whatever <laughs> comes. Thanks, Shekhar. Thank you, Nishit. Thank you all for being here. Um, what do you want me to talk about? Whatever, <clears throat> whatever comes. <laughs> well, I think uh, since this is about the future of media and entertainment in the midst of unpredictability. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, what people are talking about in the realm of emergence and creativity, and I'll summarize it as quickly as possible. If you have a system um, where you put together people from disparate disciplines, where there is no plan, so there is unpredictability, but there is some sharing of values, and the system is non-linear and open, what comes out is creative emergence. And this is a, something that's being recognized in evolutionary biology, uh, where we no longer think strictly in Darwinian terms. You know, in evolutionary biology, Darwin was known to have spoken of uh, evolution as a purely mechanistic process, random mutations and natural selection. Random is not really a good word. Unpredictability is a better word. Because random says that the system is inherently random. Unpredictability means you don't know what's happening. <laughs> it's unpredictable. Let's say I'm go, I go to Grand Central Station in New York City. The scene looks totally chaotic. But I come every day and I see there's a, there's a pattern there. So many people are going to Boston, so many people are going to Pennsylvania, approximately. And once I start to discern the pattern, then what seemed random is actually not so random. You need unpredictability, though, because if a system was totally predictable, then it does not lend itself to creativity. You know, that's why no computer 
or no artificial intelligence system can ever be really creative. It can simulate creativity, but it can't be really creative. Creativity requires the element of consciousness. And this is another whole discussion, but as far as we know right now, there's no algorithm for consciousness. In fact, creativity is based on another mathematical principle, which uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, mathematics will recognize as Gödel's theorem. So Gödel is the great mathematician from Germany who a long time ago proposed Kurt Gödel. The theorem is known by his name. He said, if you have a sufficiently elaborate system of mathematical theorems, you will always find a theorem which is true but cannot be proved. I repeat that, a theorem which is true but cannot be proved. So normally when you do mathematics, one theorem follows the other. So let's take a simple thing, simple geometry. To get to Pythagoras' theorem, you start with simpler theorems and they progressively get to there. But if you have a sufficiently elaborate system, you'll find a theorem that's there that even the mathematician who derives it says, where did it come from? He has no idea because it has nothing to do with the previous theorem. And yet, intuitively, it rings true for that person, for the mathematician. If he then adopts that in his framework, he can progress. If he doesn't, he's stymied. It's the end. Gödel's theorem is recognized now as one of the most important theorems in mathematics. And since we assume, anyway, modern science assumes that mathematics is the, nat is the language of nature, then it suggests that nature herself is creative. And if nature is creative, then nature is conscious, because you cannot have creativity without consciousness. Our creativity and our consciousness is an expression of nature's consciousness. To the extent we are comfortable with unpredictability, and we can align ourselves, and I'm coming to my agenda now, we can align ourselves with nature's intelligence through a still mind, which is meditation, and bring our intelligence to the level of being. Because while thinking is an overrated uh, attribute that human beings have, and while thinking and feeling is even more intelligent than thinking, because thinking is all here, feeling is here, but even more intelligent than feeling is just being. And when you're in the simplest state of awareness, which is just being, that's where there is this proliferation of uncertainty. That's where there is the proliferation of chaos, um, a favorite word of Shaker, chaos. So in the proliferation of chaos, in the proliferation of creativity, but shared values, not even shared goals, shared values. And that is an important distinction. Shared goals is what you want to accomplish, that you have an agenda. But shared values is let the universe express its creativity through you. Surrender to the unknown and see what emerges. So that was what I wanted to share with you as item number one. Mm -hmm. Item number two, can I continue? Yes, no, no, absolutely. Okay, we want because you, you can then comment on that. Okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so that's the first thing. A dynamical, chaotic system which is open, which is unpredictable, which has shared values, and which, in which the people participating have the ability to transcend. Item number one. Second item is that what emerges is a story. 
and there is nothing other in the universe than story. Science or scientists pride themselves in facts, but facts are meaningless without story. When you take facts and you give them a story, you bring soul to the facts. And so you must have the preparedness to look for emergence as a new story. And if it's a really new story, then it has to be that creative leap that uh, Gödel's theorem talks about. The new story has nothing to do with the old story. It has to be a, what in quantum mechanics we call a quantum leap. A quantum leap is in, in, I'm using this as a metaphor, please, but in quantum mechanics, a creative leap is when a particle moves from one location to another location without going through the space in between. And so if you've seen Star Trek, uh, the, when the captain says, beam me up, Scotty. Scotty presses a button and the captain disappears here, mm -hmm. lands up in another galaxy without going through the space in between. All imagination is actually quantum in character. If I ask you to imagine something new, then it can't be related to what is in the past. And yet we have the same facts, we have the same information. How do you take the same information, the same facts, but what emerges is a new story? And that is really true creativity. It involves death and resurrection. The old has to die, and something has to be born that did not exist before. Otherwise, it's simulated creativity, computer creativity. Which means that the same facts create a new context, and a new relationship, and a new meaning. Same facts. The old context dies. The old set of, or at least the interpretation of old relationships dies. And therefore, the old meaning dies. So without death, there is no creativity. Now, in, in our um, tradition, in the Vedantas, our physical death is ultimate creativity because reincarnation means end of the old story, new story with the same sanskaras, but new context, new meaning, new relationships. And every act of creativity, therefore, must involve death, which means relinquishing the known and not be burdened by the known, but stepping into the unknown with total non-resistance, with total acceptance, and with no anticipation. If there's resistance, if there is a burden of memory, if there is anticipation, then it's not death. And if it's not death, it's not creative. So uh, my career started with medicine, and I'll end with this. So I talked about emergence and creativity, the mechanics. Um, but I'll relate it to my own experience. So I'm trained as a physician, and then I trained in neuroscience and neuroendocrinology. And when I started seeing patients, I realized that um, outcome from disease was unpredictable. And actually, you could have two patients who had the same illness, saw the same physician, got exactly the same treatment, but some recovered and some died. That was this, despite the fact that everything was the same. But in their minds, there was a different story. There were a different context, different meaning. And it occurred to me at a certain point that healing was a creative response in consciousness that led to a creative response in biology. 
And so that has been my life's career, trying to bring, uh, bring storytelling into the field of medicine. When patients come to see physicians or their doctors, they come with a story. And unfortunately, there's no listening to the story. There's a very, there's an impulse, the way we are trained, is to write a prescription. But unless you listen to the story and you help the patient reframe the story, reinterpret the story, allow the old story to die, create a new story, there's very little chance of healing. And so that has been my uh, my career for the last 30 years and uh, at the end of this morning I'll show you a short video where that's going in the in in what we're talking about you know in, in my field which is the story of well-being not only well-being in the individual but well-being in at the workplace well-being in society and communities and well-being in our world so desperately needed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll. Uh, um, we'll take questions. Uh, Deepak, I have two. I'll kick off, and I'll. Stay and here or come, there? come here. Come <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, I'll keep my questions short and precise to set the tone for the rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one. So would you say that all human endeavor is driven by unpredictability? If there was no unpredictability, then we would not endeavor to do anything. And it is the counteraction and the ba trying to balance unpredictability that makes us go out. This is it's the paradox. It's the contradiction. And it's also what uh, is called complementarity. So the search for security is the biggest cause for insecurity, yeah. right? <laughs> the search for predictability is because life is inherently unpredictable. Unpredictable. You can't have one with the other, without the other. Chaos and creativity go together. In fact, if you go carefully into Greek mythology, you'll see that chaos and creativity are sisters. They have to be, because one needs the other. Implicit. Im, explicit enemies even are implicit allies. So at the cost of being politically incorrect, we are allies of the ISIS at the moment <laughs> because we co-create each other. And there can be no creativity, no creative solution as long as we look at, don't understand the complementarity of explicit um, enemies being implicit allies. The solution is not in winning a war. The solution is in creativity and a new story. But it'll take a long time for politicians to understand that. Or studio heads. <coughs> um, yeah, quick write, quick prescriptions to everything sounds like studio notes to me. Um, so I'm going to take questions from, from people. Uh, David, people. I would ask you yes, one sorry. question. I think this whole issue on ISIS you talked about uh, uh, what do you think should be uh, our response to ISIS situation? That's politics. Hmm? <laughs> well, I, I think, first of all, you have to understand if you use the same methods that created the problem to find a solution, and this is our collective psychosis. We've been doing it for thousands of years. Okay. The history of civilization is the history of this, what is happening right now, except that we have mechanized death and capacities for destruction that never existed before. You have to get inside the mind of your perceived enemy and see what they see as their truth. And unless you can actually totally understand that and even empathize with that because you know everyone's doing the best they can from their level of consciousness unless you can go inside that mind and emotionally feel what attracts what is the story and having understood the story 
you have to participate with them in the creation of a new story, not as a condescending missionary, but as a participant in that. Now, I'm, what I'm saying is hopelessly impractical for most people. Okay, but on a small scale, if you take students, like right now, I came from New York. I spent two days with the Jerusalem uh, um, Orchestra. What is it called? The Jerusalem Symphony of some kind, but Philharmonic. it's not. Huh? Philharmonic. No, it's not the big, it's a student orchestra with Arabs, Palestinians, and Israelis. Junior Philharmonic. And, and they create their own music. And, uh, you know, I was uh, with them last week, and they fight, they travel in a bus together, they argue, they are morally outraged by what the other is doing, but then every day they have to sit and perform as a team, and they have to create music. And so while they disagree with each other, while they are even sometimes angry with each other, they, by the way, they're all teenagers, so there is even more turbulence, but what they're producing is amazing music, and they also understand each other. They have empathy. There's, a, there's, there's the seed of a creative solution in that little microcosm. How do you take that and make it, scale it, is a huge problem. Uh, just, uh, I, I know I would love others to ask questions as well, just to extend this, because this has become a global problem and a uh, typical response to things like ISIS uh, has been uh, violence uh, against the violence. Is, uh, do you think that uh, non-violence uh, could possibly also address uh, this problem? We not, in the sense of, not in the sense of passivity. I yeah. mean, what is, what is happening is inherently evil uh, when you have beheadings, and when you have uh, people being killed the way they are, inherently it's wrong. But passive nonviolence is not the solution. I think creative nonviolence, yes. Excellent. Deepak, you've often said that a society that's lost connection, a deeper connection with its own mythology, tends to create mythic figures to fight against. Um, can you explain that? Yes, uh, we are desperately in need of mythology. If you look at the word myth, uh, etymologically it comes from the word uh, mata, matrika, mother, meter, time, measurement, music, uh, maya. Maya, very good word, because maya also means to measure. So mythology is what the collective imagination of a culture uses to explain the ineffable infinite. The infinite can't be explained, nor can the infinite be described. Therefore, my mythology captures <coughs> the, in, on the one hand, it, uh, it embodies the highest aspirations and longings of a collective imagination. Gods, goddesses, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Athena, Aphrodite, the embodiment of sex and beauty. And look at all the great gods and goddesses. But they would be useless if they didn't have the Asuras, if they didn't have the demons at the same time. They co-create each other. That's what makes mythology interesting and and inspiring in many ways. It has the divine, it has the diabolical, it has the saint, it has the sinner, it has uh, beauty and truth and goodness, it has evil. And if you look at mythological stories, whether it's the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, or the uh, great uh, Iliad, or all the Greek mythologies, you will see that this tension between the forces of light and darkness is the play in every good story, right? Whether it's a movie or, or a film on a television, this is the play between light and darkness, sacred, sinner, divine, diabolical. But 
the the good guys the good the forces of light must not win if they win it's the end of the story okay they must keep winning but they must not win the forces of darkness must not lose but they must keep losing but they're always at the edge okay that's what makes a good story there's a back story there's a present story there is a place to go to there are stumbling blocks along the way there are challenges you keep falling you keep getting down occasionally you lose um, but you win more than you lose and then when you get there you get to the mountain top it's still not uh, the end of the story you come back to tell the story to others that's the classic hero's journey that uh, joseph campbell spoke about so in places where um, where there is a lot of um, violence these days in places where you have tyrannical regimes in places where you have despots these people who are the leaders in these places it doesn't matter osama bin laden or whoever else you think of as a despot they are mythical figures okay they have captured the collective imagination at that point in history and in time so they actually embody a mythology and to vanquish them you have to have mythical figures of at least equal stature and they can't be from other countries they must emerge from within the country okay so the best best strategy then would be to identify the potential for mythical figures in that kind of a culture and usually they emerge not from the realm of science but from the realm of art why because and actually the the tyrants know this uh, shekhar they're afraid of the artists okay they are not afraid of the scientists they tell the scientists what to do okay but they are afraid of the artists every despot every tyrant is afraid of who is speaking with a rebel's voice and if it's an artist they are scared that's why they have put about do everything to avoid the, the internet coming or direct tv or or whatever you know mtv they're afraid of that but in today's world you can't control it all the boundaries are gone you know, so uh, this is the nice part right now where the future could be that those kids in iran who are under the age of 25 whose imagination is blossoming right now they know what's going on in the world in fact recently i met a young man who created an app called anchor free uh, it was a free app and he in in business school decided that he was going to not do business unless he could reach a billion people 25 year old kid so he created this app called anchor free you can check it out that allows you to go into the internet anonymously anywhere and so actually if you look at the back story of the arab spring anchor free played a big role okay because these people young people were able to congregate in tihar square and do all kinds of things using the new technology anonymously and today that's happening in venezuela it's happening in parts of the middle east maybe not rapidly enough but the future is through mythical storytelling and the coming together of entertainment art science technology i have a meeting actually at the vatican in uh, in a couple of months where the pope has invited about 25 people to talk about the confluence of art science technology religion and spirituality so that's a very progressive pop okay i'm going to take questions precise concise wonderful brilliant questions anybody yes uh, th this is unconference so i think everybody could be speaker but just make, don't make it too long so that you know yeah. everybody get chance that's the only reason but i would 
question uh, comments uh, yeah it's all you are all speakers as well right uh, <clears throat> great to see you deepak shaker thank you uh, i have two questions but maybe let me start with the first one which is media is uh, at the same time a reflection of humanity and society but it's also a projection of where it's going or where it ought to go so when media is covering things like terrorism or gun violence, things like that, there is also the contrarian side that says you're actually promoting those things, right? So what's your view on that? What role or what shape or what approach should media be taking? I don't know if you watched uh, President Clinton's uh, interview uh, yesterday. I didn't, don't know which channel it was, but he spoke, addressed your concern that he said, never in the history of the American el election has the media actually addressed issues. Never. It's always addressed scandals. Okay, and it's always addressed melodrama. And so this is a huge problem with the media that is actually now creating the politics of the next election too. I mean, <clears throat> Donald Trump is the number one runner. It's a media creation. Okay. So what do you do? And the idea is today what you can do is you can make this media irrelevant by the democratization of media um, which comes from people. Okay. And that's happening, by the way. It's not happening fast enough, but uh, who goes? I don't read the New York Times anymore. I, I go to the internet and see. Even I get news from Twitter before I get news from the media. So I think the more we see the democratization of media, the better. And also, there are, of course, with democracy, there's, again, the problem that it's it's the average of the banal, usually. <laughs> but some people can use um, uh, the internet and media marketing in a way that uh, is very effective. So again, to, I, last week I was with a young man uh, in, uh, in New York. He has a branding company called, um, what is it called? Uh, it's called... Um, his name is Raji Thomas. He's from, he's a Malayali living in uh, New York who created a new branding company. I went to see him because we were trying to create an event for peace on November 21st, which was International Peace Day. So he had lent some money <coughs> to uh, an Indian filmmaker to make a Malayali film. And um, when he, went to India, he realized that all the money he had given them, which was a few hundred thousand dollars, had been spent and there was no movie. And, you know, the, they had a good director, though, who was very inspiring, apparently, and a good record. He didn't want to lose his money. So he gave the director extra money, and the film was made. The film was made in Malayali. I don't know the name, I don't know the details but I can get them. Then he decided he was going to make it a hit. You would probably know who this person is. So he didn't want to spend money on marketing. <clears throat> From New York, he orchestrated on the internet a story about this movie, that the story is unbelievable. Can you guess what the story is? And hints and competitions. That movie became the number one gross, grossing movie in Malayali of all time. It's right now. And it's competing in international circuits as a big competitor because he got his audience engaged in unraveling the story of the movie. So that's a different brand of marketing, right? It's you use the media very inter intelligently to engage your audience in creating a new story. There's lots of creativity going on right now. Absolutely. Any, um, any more questions before I have I a I have a second part. Of, Sorry. If I can. Let, get, let's give it to other people okay. and then come back. Yes. Anybody else with a question? Well, Deepak, you... Yes. Right at the back there. Uh, Surreal. Hi, this is Surreal Desai uh, from Nishit Desai. Uh, 
So, do you see the global media addiction as an epidemic that's spreading? Because the rate at which we are consuming media is just surpassed all our imagination. You know, we are constantly yes. in media. Yes, but then the few who will stand out will be the one who will lead, will be the ones who are not addicted but are creating it. Deepak, you talked about storytelling a lot. Um, we're always in, in media, we're constantly addicted to storytelling, and I think very few of us, that's our challenge, that when you're gone, unfortunately, we'll be talking a lot about the future of storytelling because we are addicted to something called the three-act structure, and when you were talking up there, you said, well, there is no three-act structure unless there is a potential of the fourth act or the fifth act, and if you end it in a three-act structure, then you don't really have a relevant story because then either good has won and evil is gone. Um, in terms of storytelling, where do you see us going? Um, that's a question that we discuss all day. Um, in the, the technology is, is taking it all apart. Technology is taking theatrical releases apart. Technology is changing the way we can, giving us new opportunities. Um, in this form of new opportunities, you are so prolific on social media. You are telling, every time I've gone to your social media, you're telling a story, you're telling a story, you're telling a story. Where is storytelling going? What is, what is this asset that we think we own? We created people say, oh, we tell stories. <coughs> now the whole world is telling stories. Where's it going? I don't know. I know, wish, um, and it's good that I don't know. I can only say where it's going <coughs> in my field, which is well-being. Well-being, I want well-being to be the number one story in the world. Uh, and in my mind, I want to audaciously reach at least a billion people with the story of well-being and uh, show that your well-being as a person, but also your career well-being, your social well-being, your community well-being, your emotional and spiritual well-being, if framed in the right story, could solve a lot of problems in the world, including conflicts, uh, war, terrorism. That's my imagination. I don't know if it's true. But I, that's the story I want to tell, the story of well-being. Now, having said that, uh, Shekhar is the master storyteller. And I think the best stories are those that don't have a good ending or a bad ending. They, are, they end in a cliffhanger. So the story can continue. Like the Mahabharat. Yeah. Questions? Anybody? Yes? Yes. Um, I'll try to make this a, a, a question because so many fascinating thoughts. Yeah, can um, you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm, I'm Vic Bullock uh, with the Cangelo Films and HBO, formerly at the Motion Picture Academy in their international outreach. Um, do you think through creative emergence that we could, and I'll, I'll just talk about the America and India with the desperate um, cultures that, that we have and multiple cultures even within our own societies, is there a possibility of creating a global mythology this is for you, Ann Shaker. And would that be a good thing? I'll give you a very quick point of view. I think deep down, when you talk about mythologies, uh, we have a common mythology that lets off like branches of mythology that each culture then develops as it, as it goes on according to its own circumstance. But deep down, if you look at the roots of mythology, I think all human beings have deep-rooted, similar, very, very close mythologies. Uh, that we can aspire to, and that's why we can make movies that go around the world. And if you look at some of the movies that do succeed, they, we might call the banal in the way they tell stories, but if you look at why they've made a billion dollars or two billion dollars, other than a lot of marketing, you'll find that they have very deep connected roots to mythologies that can translate from one culture to another all over the world. Um, but I'll let people take that. Well, I'm not saying this because I want to please a particular segment of society, but what we desperately need is a mythology of women as leaders. And we have, we have the themes there in every mythology. 
just take uh, the Greek mythology. So you have Demeter, the woman of power. You have Persephone, the healer and the alchemist. You have Athena, the embodiment of culture and wisdom. <clears throat> you have Aphrodite, sex, beauty, romance. You have uh, Artemis, uh, connection with nature. You have Hestia, the homemaker. And you have the mother, you know, what's her name? Uh, um, whoever. Um, Hera, no, Hera was the powerful one, so Demeter is the mother. Take these seven themes, which are there in all mythologies, <coughs> and you create the next genre of global mythology with the divine feminine archetype. There's not one movie right now, you know, some stuff, Superwoman or some Wonder Woman, very banal. But you take one good theme and you create a new mythical figure that is the embodiment of the divine feminine, I bet you it'll be not only life transforming, but give ideas to people. Shekhar should do that. <laughs> That's a big burden for me to carry. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Deepak. Any more questions? The number of people that said, oh my God, Deepak Chopra is coming. Well, I, want to I, have a, I have a question. And uh, so please don't be shy. I know you all want to do one-on-ones. He doesn't have time today, but he, he can do it. Yes. Yes. Go on. The question is... Can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, my name is Ravi Tilak. I work for American India Foundation as a trustee. I'm trustee of that foundation. Uh, my question is, what is at the root of terrorism? And the second corollary question is, since media and entertainment has made zillions of dollars on the business of projecting terrorism, do you see any trend within them to address the bottom line causes, the root of terrorism? Very good question. Well, the facts, I don't know the answer, but I can tell you what the facts are. 50% of the world is radically poor. Less than $2 a day. Okay. Of that, 20% is less than $1 a day. So, you know, it's very easy to be where we are in this beautiful room and live with, you know, check in at the Four Seasons while the rest of the world is in misery. I mean, that it's not only true of India, it's true of everywhere in the world. We are not addressing the real issues, which are radical poverty, which is uh, exploitation of uh, women and children, uh, the slave trade, uh, which is um, uh, social and extreme social injustice, uh, which is despoiling the environment, and in the midst of that, this emerges because, uh, you know, there's a reason why we, the word fundamentalism exists, and that is fundamentals have gone in our society. We have barbaric behavior, primitive behavior, and we have modern capacities. We have drones. We, we talk about... Uh, uh, terrorism from you know which comes from certain parts of the world but um, I have met people who tell me um, these are people from formerly from the State Department and other places you have people living in Iowa who go to work every day sit in a computer in front of a computer press buttons that direct drones in remote parts of the world kill hundreds and thousands of innocent uh, people. They take a cigarette break and a coffee break, and then they go home and sleep comfortably and play with their children. If that is not collective psychosis, then what is it? So I think as long as we take sides in this terrorism thing and do not address the, uh, the systemic disease that we have, there is no solution. And the media's responsibility would be to therefore tell these compelling stories in a compelling manner. 
and and to actually speak to the part of us which we all have which has love and compassion and joy and um, empathy and desire to connect with others shekhar you will have some comments on this uh, no listen <clears throat> I completely agree with what Deepak is saying, and sometimes people ask me, "Why do you live in India?" And I say, "Well, um, the contradictions of the world exist in one place, and I find a story wherever I shift my gaze, I find another story, and the stories are always about contradiction." Unfortunately, with people who make the decisions, I mean, I'm very concerned with water issues, and what I keep saying is that as long as you, the decision makers, are getting water in your taps at call whenever you want, you're not going to understand what it is like to live. in a place with water not available to you and you have to walk 12 kilometers or 12 miles every day just to get a piece of water and then these are women that do it girls that do it they cannot go to school not because we cannot provide them education because we cannot provide them water uh, so the deprivations that i'm talking about exist if you go to mumbai the deprivations exist across the road they're not some other country that it's happening it's just you really look across the road and so sometimes we we find ways to create walls between us from our own environment and so where does your house end what is the walls where where do you live do you live in your house do you live in your village do you live in your city do you live on this planet and if you there everything else the division is artificial it's in your mind you can create it wherever you can sit in a car and drive and roll up the windows turn on the air conditioner and drive through a slum and and, and assume that the slum does not exist So um yeah it's a division that we create so that we don't feel guilty guilt kills us so we don't want to feel guilty and we try and and drive guilt away Sorry go ahead Carl provoke people enough now <coughs> Yeah yes uh, Carl Trego Yeah go ahead. Um, In, introduce yourself Yeah my name is Carl Mata I'm an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley uh, founder CEO of Adcast So I very much agree with uh, Deepak uh, that uh, ending poverty should be the human rights issue of of our times. And last week I was at the United Nations where 193 countries for the first time they all signed the sustainable development goals for the next 15 years which are replacing the MDGs. And most of the issues that you mentioned about gender equality, ending poverty they're all part of that 17 goals. given the fact that we have 7 billion smartphones today in the world can we how do we get great storytellers like folks like you to to bring that amplification of those goals and how it can be solved in a constructive way in in new media directly speaking to the to the audience rather than the the traditional media so that we can all work together in actual implementation of those goals the fact that we now have for the first time the heads of the states and everyone who has signed off and said that we are going to implement on these goals i would definitely give up on them first <laughs> because it's all talk i mean even the mdgs where are we now with the mdgs and the this year was supposed to be the target year i think though what you can do is and what you've raised right now is a very important thing can we expand this conversation we are having yeah. and make it critical mass and yes we can with the, with the right technology with the right people with the shared values as i said not the same goals keeping a system unpredictable and seeing what emerges if you expand this conversation there are many creative compassionate imaginative people in the world they'll take it to the next level you don't even have to worry but you do have the technology to create the ecosystem and once you have the technology to create the ecosystem that should be number one priority in the world right now and uh, you know expand the conversation you don't have solutions but live the questions you know we are not living the questions we are not asking every day how do we solve radical poverty okay if we keep asking these questions and we get people in a dynamic ecosystem through technology maybe something will emerge and if it doesn't we can go to the bar and have a drink i totally agree with you i have more faith in storytellers and artists like you folks than the government heads who're going to solve this problem so that's why i'm bringing it up 
Thank so you. how do you do that? I think uh, how do you expand this conversation? Uh, because we talk, we should do this, but uh, just trying to figure out if we, you, you, oh. each one of you here uh, is a thought leader, you know, and that's the beauty of this uh, small uh, so, unconference is. Uh, are there any ideas that we can play around with? Well, if 193 head of states can come together at the United Nations and say, well, we want to do this and make this as the goals, can 193 great storytellers can come together and say, we're going to focus on this and we're going to tell stories every day and try to solve the problem. Can we build an ecosystem like using, you know, what Deepak just said, that can we create an ecosystem towards a specific... Well, right here, by the way, you have a microcosm of that. Do what the Pope is trying to do, right. which is amazing. You know, bringing scientists, artists, <laughs> spiritual and religious people and technology people together and see what comes out of it. That's a very big initiative. <laughs> And, you know, coming from the Vatican it has a little force behind it. But it should come from entrepreneurs. It should come from technology people because the technology people have the resources to make this happen. It should come from where you are, Silicon right. Valley. Absolutely. You know, and bring together and create this critical mass in the world. Well, later this afternoon, I'll demonstrate an application that can help to do that. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> good. Yeah. And so, so next year's theme, I think, we'll pick up some of those ideas. <laughs> Let's bring some of the other people together. Yeah, please. Uh, your name and little introduction. Hi. There we go. <laughs> I'm Rina Ismail. Um, I'm a composer of uh, I'm Western music and also Indian classical music. I, I work between those two genres. Um, First, I just want to say thank you so much for what you said about women. I think it takes both um, men and women to make this change, and it's, it's really important. Um, thank you. Um, my question is, um, we talk a lot about um, N narrative storytelling, you know, about telling stories through the media, telling stories through um, films, which are kind of narrative. And um, working in music, I work a lot with non-narrative storytelling. And um, I was really um, uh, glad to hear your story about the Jerusalem Symphony, those those kids. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what your experience is with that and the power of non-narrative storytelling in its own way to kind of create a different narrative, if you will. <coughs> I'm not sure what you mean by non-narrative. Story is a narrative. It's, there's a difference between plot and narrative. Well, perhaps, like, yeah, more, a more abstract, like in the sense yeah. that a piece of music doesn't have like a plot to it. Um. Yeah, I think that some of the great art, greatest art, whether it's a painting, a painting has a narrative, and it's because we are, I am able to listen to your music, and your music may not have a narrative, but till your music can create a narrative in my mind, I don't hold on to it. Now, a narrative does not need to be a story because we've actually vulgarized the world's story to mean a three-act structure or something. It can be bits of emotion that I get. And I, when I absorb those bits of emotion, they provoke me in me my own stories of my own self. And then the whole thing gets together. So I can go on listening to Mozart's symphony. And each time, it creates a story that I perceive that maybe Mozart did not have in his mind. And that's the beauty of, of music. And that's the problem sometimes when we filmmakers go on to make films. We are forced to tell you the plot and hit it on the head and say, feel this, feel this, take this, close up, here's the dialogue, here's that. The beauty of, say, uh, you know, Van Gogh's paintings is he was had a narrative in his mind, but when you stand in front of the painting, you are getting a narrative of your own life, and that is a story. So unless there's a design is a story. You look at a chair, a beautiful chair, it tells you a story. Everything is a story. You are a combination of an ever-changing, constantly fluid idea of stories all the time. Um, so I, I actually am jealous of, of composers because they're able to create a vast amount of stories in their listeners. And we filmmakers are forced to create much narrower stories. And therefore, we try very hard by creating subtext. But they, you play with subtext. It's all subtext. Um, questions? What will be the new media, by the way? I think we uh, media media is, is more like a medium, if you please. What exactly is media? Because uh, lawyers start on the definitional context. <laughs> uh, you know, because I speak something, you hear something else, and. Uh, uh, I think uh, the media, uh, right from ancient times when we had uh, 
theatricals and drama and live performances to tell Mahabharata and now we've got the, then came audio and the mechanical things and now the videos and social media is the next, uh, that, that, that's what is currently going on. What's likely to be the next uh, media, the social media? Well, um, likely, uh, of yeah. course, we all guess what. I'm going to ask the, the audience that and ask Deepak that, but I can tell you that the, the, the beauty of art, the absolute beauty of art lies in that contradiction that you just stated, and I said, I say something, you hear something else. Yeah. Therein lies the beauty of art. I mean, if you hear exactly what I'm saying, then there is no art. You know? <laughs> um, but, yeah, what is the next thing? I mean, yes. Hello, yes. My name is Kate McCallum. I'm with the Producers Guild of America, as well as a company called Vortex Immersion Media. And what we're seeing on the landscape emerging is immersive storytelling, not only 360 full surround visuals and imagery performance, as well as um, virtual reality is huge. It's coming, and I think the power of virtual reality is going to be extraordinary to open uh, empathy and compassion in the participants that are experiencing it. Already people are using it for journalistic purposes. Um, there are artists that are out uh, recreating experiences so that you can put yourself into a situation like being in Syria during a, um, a riot and actually be present to the reality of, of the challenges that we face in the world, whereby this division that you speak about, we're able to fully um, be present to a, almost a, a realistic interpretation of a 360 full experience. So I think that um, as we look at the continuation of the media landscape that these uh, story worlds are what we're looking at and then all the different ways that we can express our stories through multi-platforms and new media technologies that are continuing to evolve. So we don't lose um, traditional, but we add to it. So we have a feature film, but we also have an extended version of that that's experienced through um, online or virtual reality or 360. So I think that we're in, in an extraordinary time to be able to address uh, many of the challenges that you're, we're all talking about today through the potential of these new um, formats. Yeah. Anybody else? I think that's going to be very powerful, no doubt about it, because if you can experience the same pain others are experiencing, I think that tells you a virtual lot. And virtual reality is definitely the, yeah, I the think, next. And that will change, uh, I think, the way we think altogether. So it's, it's uh, uh, in fact, uh, in the afternoon, uh, we are going to hear Alex uh, McDowell. I, I have a question, sure. that, and it's a question to myself because I'm getting into virtual reality and we're working on virtual reality. We've discussed that often. I sometimes wonder, are we actually taking away the idea of interpretation, the more immersive we get? How do we hold on to the idea that there is, that what you're experiencing should only be 10% of what you imagine? Um, when my grandmother used to tell me stories as a child, I was completely immersed. I was immersive storytelling because I was open. I was a child. I did not have prejudices, and I was I was capable of dreaming and imagining. Over time, as you get taught many many things, your your ability to ima imagine wild, and that's why every creative person says that. That's all I want to do. What what is Picasso said that? If I could paint like a child, then I've learned how to paint. Um, and so the idea of holding on to being a child all the time is that very fact that you can get immersed in your current ideas and, and really imagine. So even though I'm getting into virtual reality, I keep asking myself is how do you keep that alive? Because storytelling ultimately is interpretation. How do you keep the, the <coughs> interpretive quality of what other people get? So I walk into an immersive, into immersive technology and then can I dream my own story? And that's going to be the challenge of how we can do it. Otherwise, it will not get popular. Otherwise, it's just it is that you you know when you're sitting on a on a big dipper and you're going down in a, in a you know that you just get immersed. But then that experience is gone at the end of it. How do you give experiences that people can go on and on and on living and imagining the experience and 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 drawing from it for a long time? So I still remember Godfather, 
And each time I see it, I get a different idea. Mm -hmm. If Godfather was an immersive experience, would, I, would that happen to me? That's a question that I constantly face, and I don't know the answer yet. So maybe you need both, right? Exactly. You need to, uh, both. Yeah. yeah. And, I, yeah. and I also think that Deepak's point about um, exercising the stillness of mind is essential <laughs> in us <coughs> keeping our imagination healthy and childlike. Yeah. So if we can balance that with like you said, hybriding the experiences. It's not giving up or replacing one for the other, but adding to it <clears throat> that allows yeah. us that yeah. freedom and ability. I think, <laughs> my thought. Yeah. I think Deepak is gonna, yes, go ahead, please. So one last quick question for Deepak. Uh, your um, name and introduction already. Shit. Uh, my name is not shit, it's Neda. Um, <laughs> quick question to you, Deepak. I saw you on Conan O'Brien a year ago and you had this fantastic looking headset that seemed to achieve what's being discussed right now, which had a lot of flashy lights. And uh, can you tell us more about it? And where can you get one of those headsets? I'd love to have one at home. Well, mm -hmm. it's now in its fourth uh, iteration. It's called the Dream Weaver. And the next uh, uh, iteration is going to be called the Dream Master. You can go into um, on Google, check it out. But what it is, it's it's a technology basically, which uh, feeds in sound <coughs> and binaural beats. You know, binaural beats are uh, beats to the brain that are slightly disharmonic, but they quickly <laughs> take you into uh, a delta wave or theta wave uh, brain waves. And then it also, if your eyes are closed, and they better be, it um, flashes lights at a high frequency, but slowly <coughs> down, uh, down low, um, makes the frequency slower. So you start at 18 cycles per second, and you slowly bring it down to four. And your brain entrains with both the sound and the music, and within literally, uh, Shekhar, you've tried it, right? Yeah. With the 10, 15 minutes, you're in a dreamlike state. And many people who are exhausted actually go to sleep. So this is going to be the future technology, no sleeping pills, <laughs> using technology to induce altered states, not necessarily transcendence, because there's no substitute for authentic meditation, for transcendence. But yes, altered state. So that's what the technology is. But right now, there are many technologies. This is only one. So there's new technology from MIT called Muse, which allows you familiar with that, right? It allows you to look at your brain waves and through bioregulation, regulate your brain waves. There's HeartMath, which allows you to uh, look at your heart waves and regulate them. Um, there are, of course, all these little <coughs> other things that measure sleep and exercise, etc. And um, people are developing algorithms now to see how these correlate with each other and your state of well-being. That's what my passion is at the moment. Yep. Yes. Before I go, I might want to show a th two-minute video. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rashika. I am uh, mainly a screenwriter, and uh, I actually listen to binaural beats every morning. Mm -hmm. And I've read a lot about it in the sense that apparently I listen to 432 hertz, but I've read that that there's sort of this conspiracy that everything on the radio and television and satellites and the sounds around us are tuned to against 432 hertz or against the actual frequency of the universe. Um, so I was just curious what your thoughts are on that, if, that, if you could validate that or... I'd like not to believe that, yeah. but one of the things <laughs> that people are discovering is that every emotional state has a certain frequency. So five 32 is the so-called love frequency. And, uh, oh, that's good. Uh, I have 532 you. <laughs> uh, you can look at this frequency in honeybees and, you know, when people fall in love, etc., yeah. etc. So, yes, this is a future technology that is emerging. 
and um, uh, be on the lookout for that. Uh, there's a, a little thing that I'm looking at right now called the love shaker. We love that. It's called the love tuner. <laughs> so you wear it around your neck and you then you actually can uh, resonate at that frequency by blowing into a whistle. And it makes this wonderful sound. Uh, we'll see. I don't know. So what I wanted to show you is a, a, a video, and I'm actually embarrassed to show it now, because Shekhar is sitting here. It was made uh, 12 hours ago on a whim. Of what I'm trying to do is bring together technology, social well-being, physical well-being, and ultimately purpose in life uh, in trying to create uh, what we call uh, a well-being index that would be dynamic. So it would take data from you on a daily basis and ultimately create a well-being index for you. At the center, we have people who actually every day practice all the at our center, practice all the principles mm -hmm. of well-being. So this is an app called uh, geo.com, jio.com, uh, and I want you to look at it. Uh, it was made just on the spur of the moment, and it is, I'm sorry to say, at the moment elitist, because it doesn't address the big issues that uh, yeah, you spoke about. And, uh, you know, we need to go beyond this elitism, but then hopefully we can bring the elites to help with those issues too. Do you have it somewhere here? I Let's see if you... energetic body, loving, compassionate heart, reflective, alert mind, lightness of being. Wow, that's lovely. It has some things missing, nutrition, sleep, etc. But we'll get there. So wasn't this uh, good? The session, how was it? Great. And uh, 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 Deepak has to leave for I think Mexico today, or so. And we have to allow him to go. Next time we'll not let you go. Uh, you know, immersing into the whole thing here. So uh, the, I think uh, the, the, uh, we'll end this session. But uh, we, uh, Deepak has another ten minutes. Oh, he has. Yeah, we may not, but Deepak I think I would uh, love yeah. to discuss. Uh, yeah, I, I have uh, a question. Yeah, 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 go ahead. So, sorry, can I just ask one question, and then you can come? Thank you. It's a question that's bothered us 
all the time is, so I'd like to open it out, is where does creativity come from? Does all creativity happen inside the confines of our skull, in our brain, in the synapses of our brain, or do we access creativity? And if we do access creativity, what is the process of accessing that creativity, and where and how? Okay, so that should be the last question. <laughs> Uh, Shekhar and I have spent a lot of time together. Um, we are not only good friends, we are like brothers. And he has spent a lot of time at, the, at our center. For the last uh, 20 years or so, um, I have um, explored, along with others, what is known as the hard problem of consciousness. How many people are familiar with this phrase, the hard problem of consciousness? No one. Okay, so this is what the hard problem of consciousness is. If you look at the 120 open questions in science, the number one open question in science is, what is the universe made of? And believe it or not, no one knows. Okay, because 70% of the universe is something called dark energy which is not energy in the usual sense, E is equal to mc squared, not you know how we think of energy. It's a very mysterious force that is an anti-gravity. It's expanding the universe faster than the speed of light. The distance between galaxies is, part, uh, is expanding right now faster than the speed of light. Uh, so even though the universe is only 14 billion years old, the cosmic horizon, which is the furthest distance from here, <coughs> Um, is 47 billion light years away from us. And beyond that, galaxies are tumbling right this moment faster than the speed of light. Uh, not into the unknown, into the unknowable. Because by the time light gets from there to where we are, our solar system will have exhausted its thermonuclear energy and burnt itself up into the heat death of absolute zero. So it's unknowable. That leaves 30% of the universe remaining, of which 26% is another mysterious entity called dark matter. And the reason it's called dark matter is it's invisible. And the reason it's invisible is it's not made of atoms. It doesn't reflect light, absorb light, emit light, or have anything to do with light. So why do we call it matter, even though we it's invisible, intangible. Uh, it seems to bend space-time in the same way as regular matter, so it holds a galaxy together. It's the scaffolding of a galaxy. If it didn't, the universe would fall apart. The solar system would fall apart, your body would fall apart. That leaves 4% of the universe, which is atoms, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen of which 99.9999% is invisible interstellar dust. So again, we, we don't see it. It's mostly hydrogen and helium, which hasn't fused to become regular atoms, to become stars, to become galaxies. And according to modern cosmologists, that part of the universe's evolution is over. It will never it will never fuse to become atoms. So the visible universe, which is hundreds of billions of galaxies, and literally hundreds of billions and billions and billions, I could say that forever, stars, and trillions of trillions of trillions of planetary systems. Our modern cosmologists say there are about 60 billion habitable planets in our own galaxy, according to them. Uh, in fact, MIT is now creating an app every time they discover a new planet, uh, which may have a biosphere similar to us. All of that is 0.01% of the universe. Mm -hmm. The rest is either unknown or unknowable. Now here's where it gets even more interesting. This 0.01%, which is made up of atoms, atoms are made up of particles, and particles are waves. And these waves do not occupy any space that we know of. If you ask scientists 
where do these waves exist? They say in mathematical space. But what is mathematical space? So it's this multi-dimensional Hilbert infinite space. But where is it? We don't know. So bottom line, what's the universe made of? We don't know. All of it, we don't know. The second hard question, so that's the first hard question. The second hard question is what is called the hard question of consciousness. How do we experience what we call reality? And how do we know if it's actually real, what we're experiencing? So, scientists are assuming, until recently, that your ability to think, or your ability to imagine, or your ability to perceive is a property of your brain. <coughs> but if you ask them how, they can't tell you. So let's see, for example, you're looking at this, uh, this object, or you're looking at the screen, and you see the color red or blue. <coughs> What's happening is there are invisible photons going from here to your eyes. They're not blue or red or anything, they're invisible. When they get to your eyes, they go through your retina, up, they go through your lens into your retina where they create a chemical reaction which sends a, an electrical current to your brain which then induces a chemical reaction in a neural network and you see a three-dimensional world in space and time. How? No one knows. Okay, if I ask you to imagine a, I can ask you to do it right now, imagine a sunset on the ocean. You have an experience, right? You're seeing a sunset on the ocean, aren't you? Where's the picture? There's no picture in your brain. All there is in your brain is electrochemistry. So where are you having the experience of me right now? And I've sat down with neuroscientists and cognitive scientists and they can't tell you. Some will say it's happening in the eyes, but your eyes are 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters. They're nine centimeters apart. By the time light gets into your retina, it gets inverted. Your retina is curved. So if I, you were having the experience of seeing me in your eyes, you should be seeing two of me about this size, upside down and curved. <laughs> so it's not happening in your eyes. Then some people say it's happening in the brain. And how do I or this room fit inside your brain? Yes, there are certain chemical reactions happening in your brain, but how do you have this experience in your brain? How do you look at the stars and the whole galaxy? How does that fit in your brain? No one knows. In fact, there's no biological basis for what we call consciousness. So where is this experience happening? No one knows. Okay. How is this experience happening? No one knows. Which leaves us with the two biggest questions of existence. Number one, what is existence? And number two, how do we know we exist? We know there is existence. Something exists, but we don't know what it is. Okay, It appears like this. And how do we know that it exists? We don't know. We don't know what existence is, we don't know what non-existence is. Uh, and we don't know how we know what we know. So, we go back to what you asked. Where does creativity come from? Where does thought come from? Where does intention come from? Where does imagination come from? Where does insight come from? Intuition, awareness, we don't know. Now, our Indian great sages said, it's the chit akash. Okay, so akash is the Sanskrit word or Hindi word for space. And chit is imbued with consciousness. So the emptiness of space is not just a void, but it's the womb of creativity. It's where the universe is coming from right now. But even that has a problem, because as Einstein explained, if you took away all the objects of the universe, let's say you took every material object away, 
you wouldn't be left with space. Even space-time would disappear. Because in order to experience safe space-time, you need objects. If you take away all the objects, space-time disappears. What is left is totally dimensionless. What is it? No one knows, but that's where probably creativity is coming from. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. So this was the unpredictability of time in experience here. And uh, Deepak, really thank you so much. Really appreciate your finding time and being with us. Uh, yeah. and, uh, okay, so we apologize, but that was very fascinating. Let's give him an applause as he walks out of the door. Yeah, I have. We talked yesterday.